Welcome, everyone. It's uh, great to have you all here. Uh, it's uh, uh, both online and, and uh, live in the audience here. Uh, good turnout. I really appreciate it. We have an extra special guest with us here today, and I'm excited to introduce him in a minute. Let me offer a, a preliminary comment or two. Um, this event is focused to some extent on, on commercial shipping and shipbuilding, which is an important part of, of the industrial base, and we need to we need to pay a lot more attention to it. Uh, and and so, uh, so we've uh, organized this around that idea to some extent. But I also, and we will get into those issues, um, I, given the experience and, and, um, uh, that our guest has in the, in the uh, naval side of things and in in his ability to speak with authority on some, of, on some of these key issues, specifically around the Navy, I want to make sure we take advantage of that expertise uh, to uh, explore issues that are closer to that side of the equation. But we'll have plenty of time um, to, uh, to get into some of the other issues, uh, both at, at the end of this uh, conversation with Mr. Courtney, and uh, also for those who are interested, we are planning to have a workshop-style discussion uh, after the interview uh, concludes today. So uh, we'll uh, have an opportunity before or at the end of the interview to have questions from the floor. Uh, let me offer a brief introduction to our guest, Mr. Courtney. He's elected to Congress in 2006 to represent Connecticut's 2nd Congressional District. He serves on the House Armed Services Committee uh, and the House Committee on Education and Workforce. He's been the leading Democrat on the uh, Sea Power Subcommittee of Armed Services since 2018. Four years as a chairman, and, and now uh, when, when the Democrats were in the majority, now the ranking member. Uh, with Republicans in the uh, majority. He co-chairs the uh, Bipartisan Congressional Shipbuilding Caucus. Uh, he was recognized, this goes back to ways, he's recognized in Connecticut as the, quote, Democrat most admired by Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> he had uh, under, earned an undergrad degree at Tufts University um, and a law degree from the University of Connecticut. And that school, for some reason, has been in the news recently. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I'll cut right to the chase. Uh, you know, if the, if the job of uh, Secretary of State uh, comes open at some point in the future, should Dan Hurley be put in an application <laughs> for it? Uh, welcome. It's great to have you here with us today. Um, let me uh, jump into it and start with the sort of the security situation around the world, uh, <clears throat> ge geopolitics. Uh, when I got into the uh, uh, interested in and in, in involved in um, the connection between commercial shipping and national security in the early 90s, um, the planning scenarios that the Pentagon had uh, assumed that the, the US needed to be prepared to fight and win two major regional conflicts sort of simultaneously. There was no talk then about near peer competitors or ge geopolitical uh, rivals that, that we have today. Um, uh, now we see. Uh, year three of the Ukraine conflict. We see uh, the, the uh, uh, war in Israel and, and Gaza uh, going past the six-month mark. We have the Houthis shooting at commercial ships in, in, uh, in the Gulf of Aden. Uh, and most importantly, President Xi uh, being very clear that uh, his intentions are that China overtake uh, America as the leading global superpower. It seems like a very different world than we had 30 years ago. And do you want to comment on where we sure. are? Sure. So um, uh, again, when I was elected um, in 2006, <clears throat> you know, we were obviously very focused on a land war in the Middle East, and um, you know, because there really wasn't um, much other than that in terms of any threats, um, you know, it, it kind of gave Congress um, the ability, or or, or at least the um, opportunity to just sort of lose focus in terms of other parts of our national security, um, you know, uh, matrix of, of uh, platforms and programs. So, um, you know, my district, which is home to General Dynamics Electric Boat, um, you know, at the height of the Cold War had probably 28,000 to 30,000 uh, workers. Uh, when I got elected, it was uh, basically in a downward spiral to about six or 7,000. And, um, you know, when you when I got there, it's just like, well, you know, what do we need submarines for? And, um, yeah. you know, obviously, fast forward to today, the, you know, the world obviously looks a lot different. And again, it's not just submarines. It's just, um, you know, the um, peace dividend, the, you know, the 
uh, unrestricted um, environments that you know commercial shipping and you know right. um, just um, trade and activity is now obviously a lot different and it's really um, you can just sort of feel how you know we're sort of scrambling to to try and respond to this in so many different areas so the topic today which you know again on commercial uh, shipping you know I do think actually does play directly into the national security um, situation particularly with the industrial base I mean one of the things that you know, I think, um, you know, happened in terms of the decline of shipbuilding is that we just let commercial shipbuilding almost evaporate. And, you know, there's a lot of explanations for why that happened. And, you know, as a result, it, it, it's had a spillover effect in terms of um, naval shipbuilding because you just you did not have the uh, industrial base that existed in, in the 40s and 50s that could move from, you know, commercial to, to naval and that was so critical in World War II right. in terms of uh, being able to respond uh, to that uh, uh, demand. And, you know, we're now in a place right now where, as I said, you know, everybody's sort of scrambling to try and sort of, you know, increase um, the size of our fleet, um, you know, deal with the, what's happening to commercial shipping uh, that's out there. And we have an industrial base, which today is roughly about 15% of the U.S. economy is in manufacturing. You know, you go back to the end of the Cold War, it was closer to 35%. Mm -hmm. And those numbers come from um, uh, this guy, Matt Sermon, who's over at the, um, he run, helps run the Columbia program, that, you know, which we're recapitalizing the, the SSBN program that's there. So, you know, um, when you think about, and, you know, we were talking about Arthur Herman's uh, book, uh, you know, the Freedom's Forge, you know, one of the reasons why the U.S. was able to respond so quickly is we had a very big manufacturing industrial base. You know, they were building cars instead of tanks. Right. But, you know, getting that shift, you know, it was just, a, you know, a lot easier in terms of just the, having a workforce in place. Now we're trying to just sort of reconstitute uh, a manufacturing base, which I actually think is, is showing really good positive trends that are out there right now. But it's, um, you know, it's really the question of the day, in my opinion, uh -huh. in terms of, I mean, just everything from, you know, Stinger missiles to, you know, Patriot missiles to, you know, ships to uh, airplanes, you know, we're, we're, we're scrambling yeah. right now. And we, had, we haven't had to use them and now we're using them in, in large quantities in right. terms of the weapons. Um, uh, so, so do you do you think that we have a, an adequate sense of urgency to sort of address these issues? So, I mean, I, uh, I I think the industrial base um, and military leadership. I think uh, we we are spending a lot more time talking to specifically about the industrial base than I recall in my times that I'm here. And the the fact that um, Under Secretary Laplante issued his industrial base policy report at the end of December which I don't think the DOD, if they ever did it, if they did it, you know, it'd been decades and, you okay, know, okay. since that. And, and, you know, just to me that the fact that they understand that as a priority in terms of, you know, planning and budgets, um, I personally, I feel it's an all of government sort of undertaking because there are programs in terms of, you know, uh, the Department of Labor and Department of Education, you know, that can help sort of grow um, the programs to get yeah. young people and others into uh, the trades. Um, uh, so, I mean, it, it's sort of happening partly because of external pressure and partly because people actually are really now starting to understand we, we've, we've got to raise our game and fast. Yeah, we're moving, we're moving, starting to move in the right direction right. And, and, and hopefully fast enough. Um, your position on the, on the workforce uh, right. committee uh, certainly gives you a chance to uh, uh, you know, make a difference in terms of, of workforce development and so on. Uh, you and I were on a panel about a year and a half ago at the Shipbuilding Caucus uh, talking about uh, workforce challenges in the shipbuilding side of things, and I threw in a little bit about the Mariner challenges yep. at that time. Um, and, and, I, and I have a sense that progress, I have a sense that at that time these were still sort of new challenges, somewhat understood, uh, but, but still evolving. Um, and, and, and I do also have the sense that we've made progress since then, but what's your sense of where we stand in terms of where we where we've come from and where we need to get to. So um, <clears throat> to, just as one sort of little snapshot to sort of describe where, where I think, um, you know, there's efforts being made. So last year, the CEO of Electric Boat announced that their hiring goal was 5,750 people in calendar year 2023. Wow. 
which again, people will have the same reaction you just had, <laughs> which is lot. you're out of your mind. Yeah. You know, and again, this is engineer design and trades. And so um, at the end of the year, uh, it was 5,300 they, they, they were able to, to get to. Wow. And you know, it was a combination of a number of um, factors. And by the way, their, their hiring goal for 2024 is the same. It's wow. 5,300. And um, so um, you know, part of it was just recruitment um, all across the country, particularly in the sort of higher skilled positions, engineers, et cetera. Um, but in terms of um, the, the trades, you know, the number one, the, the uh, career and technical high school systems are just now really <laughs> there. It's like their uh, moment of, of, you know, right. glory because, yeah. I mean, they are oversubscribed. I mean, yeah. kids are figuring this out, you know, that, um, you know, these are not just, um, you know, jobs in a, you know, uh, hairdressing or not to, to denigrate <laughs> that, but I mean, that's really where the trade schools kind of were focused. Right. And now, I mean, they are definitely uh, pushing hard in terms of getting kids in there. Comprehensive high schools, non-trade, non-career technical high schools. Now you starting to see that they are sort of bringing back, they call them career pathways. In my generation, they used to call them shop class, you know, where, <laughs> where kids were actually given an opportunity to sort of pursue a different sort of pathway that's there. And um, you know, the Department of Education, which funds the Perkins Grant Program that funds the trade schools, you know, that is a essential funding stream. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know about it that much, but it's, right. it's very important. Um, and um, they also are now starting their Career Connected High School Program, which is a competition for school districts around the country to get kids sort of into these, these programs. It's not a lot of money, but it's, it's, it's forcing change um, and the boards of education out there to sort of create these, these programs that are out there. But I think the secret weapon in terms of trying to get younger people to sort of you know, approach their future differently is the cost of uh, student loan debt. I mean, I think yeah. that is really almost created, it's a trauma almost out there for families in terms of kids you know, suddenly realizing that going out and borrowing big sums of money to go to college with questionable Right. sort of um, you know, gainful employment is just really, I think it, it, there's a change that's happening out there. Again, that's going to take a while to, to sort of speed things up, but that's where the Department of Labor programs, the Workforce Investment Act, which is the pre-apprenticeship programs for young adults and even sometimes older adults who can go in in a rapid accelerated curriculum that's designed with input from the employers, um, you can get really you know, uh, good results in a hurry. So last year, one of the reasons why EB was able to hit that high number was because the workforce investment program that they had started back in 2016, our office helped them you know, get along on that. Um, it's called the Manufacturing Pipeline Initiative. They graduated 1,000 um, metal trades, you know, welders, electricians, outside machinists. Um, and the good news is, is they designed the curriculum in such a way that there's enough immersion in terms of the work that they don't that they that they have high retention, I mean. Yeah. So out of that 5,300 last year, it's an 86 percent retention that's number, great. which that's is great. that's where the struggle is in other yards. They haven't quite figured out that right mm -hmm. sort of mixture of you know long enough, but not too long um, in terms of getting people uh, into the into the trades that are there. So. Um, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, the Navy is now investing directly into the industrial base um, with facility expansion, um, you know, technology expansion, but also workforce. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, as I said, to get from like less than 15% manufacturing in our economy up to a higher number, I mean, it's going to take a number of yeah. years to get there. But I, yeah. I really think there's a lot of forces, and don't underestimate that sort of student loan debt issue in terms of getting people to sort of get their heads and, and guidance counselors out, out of the fact that, you know, everybody's got to go to college. Right. That, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And, and, and uh, I, let me just segue a little bit in terms of the lifestyle. That seems to be a component, too, at least cer certainly on the maritime side of things, on the, on the mariner workforce, they, they, they uh, had been facing uh, you know, deployments of six weeks to, to longer uh, uh, away from home, on the ships, living on the ships, uh, until <laughs> Starlink finally became a little bit more ubiquitous on, on U.S. flagships, at least. Um, they were basically cut off. Uh, their, their communications uh, capabilities were cut off. So that, that, when you talk to a kid 
who's you know coming out of high school or uh, you know this is this is the lifestyle you'll be looking at. You'll make a decent living, and you'll work you know six weeks on, four weeks off. You'll have a decent sort of schedule uh, if that's what you're for. But but I think that's changing now. I think recognition that that. Uh, uh, that the lifestyle has to adapt, certainly on the mariner side of things. I don't know if you see any of that on the on the shipbuilding side of things, also. No, definitely. They, um, you know, it, it's uh, so I, you know, one of the rituals in my district is you got to go at six o'clock in the morning or at election time and shake hands at the gates, sure. which is actually always an amazing experience because <laughs> they, they don't hold back; and they're going <laughs> through there. And uh, but if you look at the the profile of who's coming through. At the gates these days, I mean, it is a totally different demographic. A lot more women, you know, coming through there. I mean, you know, they're welding and, yeah. you know, laying cable just like everybody else and painting uh, in the yards there. And obviously, and it's much more underrepresented minorities that's there. I mean, really big increase in Hispanic, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, shipyard workers that are there. So, um, you know, and again, the, the recruiting and the... Um, you know, the, the way they've enticed people to come in there, I mean, they've had to adjust. They, they, they realize right. it's just not, you know, the sort of all white male, uh, right. baby boomer kind of um, yeah. era, you know, kind of way that you can attract people to go to work it, there. Is, it, is there a, uh, any uh, effort to convey the, the, the national benefit that comes from their work? I mean, it seems to me having purpose in what you do and, and having a, a, a larger purpose in what you do uh, can be an attractive part of a of a of no, I, and I do. I mean, we just uh, christened USS Idaho a few weeks ago, and you know that's the, where they do it in the yard, where the workforce can go there. And there's probably like three or four thousand people there, yeah. and they bring their families with them. It, they, and and again, it is a younger group that's doing that. Yeah. So it's not like they that's a corny sort of message. I think right. they really believe it. And, yeah. um, you know, I've been really always kind of pushing Navy uh, folks to, to show up at the job training sites to talk to them about, you know, this yeah. is a really important endeavor that mm -hmm. you're taking on here. It's not, you know, just a, a wage, which is a good wage, but mm -hmm. it's, uh, and I think that's, that's really um, important, you know, to, to really yeah. inspire and motivate people. Good. I do too. I think it's, it's sort of, under underappreciated to some extent, but uh, let, let's shift if we can to the uh, uh, administration's uh, FY25 budget request, uh, 850 billion dollars uh, for the Pentagon, which is within the spending caps. Um, t tell me what you like about it and what you, what you'd change if you could. So again, the um, Fiscal Responsibility Act, which is the bill that we passed uh, last May to avoid default, um, put spending caps in place, not in just the count, you know, last fiscal year, but also this coming fiscal year. So there's a, a one sorry, one percent increase that's allowed for defense that's in there, and mm -hmm. that's a tight number given what's going on in the world and. Um, uh, you know, we're now in the whole process of obviously trying to get things organized for, for a markup that's there. So, I mean, there's some, you know, new initiatives that are in there. Um, you know, the replicator program, some of the newer um, kind of technologies, which I think, you know, drone uh, in both right. in the air and, and on the sea surface, which I think are really important. We're seeing in Ukraine, you know, how those are being used to great right. effect. That's there, and you know we've got to start thinking about countermeasures, you know, in terms of, of dealing right. with all that. Um, but you know, there's no question that um, you know the if you look at the Navy's budget. So again, there's one percent growth that's allowed in the on the top line of the total budget. Navy shipbuilding drops by 3.7 percent from last year's appropriated level. That's a big number given what's going on in the world. Yeah. You know, clearly um, some of the shipyards are struggling to recover from COVID. But I, you know, think, and, and Dr. LaPlante, when he issued his industrial base uh, report back in December, said procurement stability is still, you know, a critical goal in terms of trying to get to, to you know, grow the industrial right. base. And when you start going up and down, so, you know, if you look at not just subs, but some of the other programs that are in the budget, and then you look at last year's fit up you know, the five-year defense plan, or you look at the 30-year shipbuilding plan, they really deviate from that. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's not just sort of a, you know, trivial pursuit kind of question. Yeah. That's something that people really look at in terms of their own business decisions right. about hiring people or investing um, in facility or, or equipment. Because, you know, 
to use Virginia again as an example, right. you know, we went to two per year starting in 2011. We have kept that cadence or the procurement cadence steady. That's helped a lot of people sort of recover from the trauma of, you know, the, the Seawolf pro program being canceled or the delay in startup of Virginia or the cutting even of Ohio program. I mean, these guys still carry those scars. Mm -hmm. And that's why really the industrial base sort of declined was just people just like, you know, right. I can't trust this program to pay the bills. And now you're going to start deviating from that. That's I, I, the, and I just came back from the Easter break. I visit a lot of smaller supply chain guys. I mean, that, that was the, 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 the chatter. It's just like, what is going on? Yeah. And that's, that's not a good way to, you know, build the base. Right. Right. We've talked about that, uh, in, in the context of commercial shipbuilding and, yep. and, uh, uh, and, you know, the, the existing commercial shipbuilding in the United States is based upon demand for shipping services in our domestic trades. And, and, uh, and we got way ahead of ourselves on the tanker side of things when, uh, when fracking hit, and and then and then found, and then <laughs> the bottom fell out when they got rid of the uh, crude oil export ban, and we had a, a huge excess of of uh, tankers uh, it built in the United States, and and uh, and so now that just sort of uh, again that has ripple effects throughout the the, sort of the the industrial base. We don't need a lot of tankers in our in our domestic trade trades right now. Um, so I, I I can relate to sort of the importance of having that predictability. Um, uh, and I think that's really important part of any any effort to to reindustrialize and get us back to where we need to be. Um, in terms of the submarine construction program now, do we have uh, you know if you want to talk a little bit about that? And I think you have been, so I don't want to uh, go well, back. There's over just one other point I would because sure. one of the, the the points the Navy has been uh, making over the last few weeks is just that well, there's such a big backlog, you know that um, right. you know there's there's plenty of work for them to do. So. Um, a, there's always been a backlog for the Virginia program. I mean, the, the contract term, you know, for building is about 65 to 70 months. It's now gotten a little longer because right. of COVID that's there. But um, the mere fact that there's a, a backlog is not really anything, you know, that um, big of a change. But the, you know, the backlog that they said, well, it's 16, you know, Virginia class submarines. And that is true today. But by the end of this year, we're going to be um, commissioning and delivering the USS uh, New Jersey, the USS Massachusetts, and the USS Iowa. Again, the, so that, that backlog is just going to drop to 13, mm -hmm. which is getting back closer to what the normal backlog is. And again, we've got more coming online in 2025 and 2026. And um, so, you know, these are all the sort of back and forth debates that we're having right now. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the other piece is just that the boat that they're cutting, we've already paid for long lead items on that boat. Again, the, um, right. you know, you don't just fund it in one year. Right. We've already paid for the reactor in 2023. We've already paid for ship set in 2024, I mean, the budget that Biden just signed you know, mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, there's, there's money for that boat that's already in there. So there's sunk costs that are already in this boat. And, and the question is, is like, so that now we stop you know, the procurement right. for that boat and what happens to these components, which we uh, honestly, we're still sort of uh, waiting for answers yeah. on this. And I, I just think um, you know, that, that given the need for, for subs and, and I, I, you know, we go, that, these, I think these, that's critical. And the, the briefings that we're getting right now in terms of just the, um, you know, China's development of its, um, you know, missile technology and rocket force is really the biggest driving factor why subs are so important right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, it's very difficult to get anything into the first island chain that's on the surface or in the air. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, that, that's, and so, um, you know, that the, the demand is, you know, completely a settled issue. I mean, Admiral Aquilino came over and did his posture review from the Indo-Pacific just recently and, you know, reiterated that the same point, how critical the submarine force is to, mm -hmm. to you know, hold the line out there. Um, we're hearing the same thing in the uh, European command and North American command because, you know, Russian submarine activity, and this is public, you know, is definitely much more busy and, right. and you know despite Ukraine Putin is still moving forward with his submarine construction program the Severodvinsk class and and Kula's and others so you know it's it's not like it's letting up 
out there. And, um, you know, again, the sunk costs, the fact that we are recovering, you know, uh, production cadence, I, you know, there, there's, you know, definitely high degree of skepticism about what they sent over to us. Yeah, interesting. Um, I'd like to shift now, while we have a few minutes uh, left, uh, uh, to more directly discuss the, the issues of sea lift and, yep. and commercial construction. Um, uh, and, and give you, we, we can do this a little bit as a lightning round, although I think we have enough time to expand on any, any of this stuff you'd like to, but I'll tee it up and you, you can take a swing. And I want to make sure we get uh, to audience questions um, in a few minutes also. Um, our, the, the Ready Reserve Fleet, for those who may not be aware of it, it's the sort of the standby fleet that's uh, clustered around uh, the continental United States, uh, ready to move on five to 10 days activation notice and, and carry supplies to troops wherever they, they, they wherever it might be needed. That fleet is ancient. Um, and it's been a converse, uh, subject of conversation for a long time. Do you see any progress being made there? So um, you're right. They are ancient, and they um, uh, they did they do these you know sort of um, exercises to sort of test right activation the, the, yeah. right activation exercises, and they are pretty grim when when you get the results right. back in terms of just getting these um, vessels out. And, 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 you know, on an emergency basis, right. which, you know, could happen, you know, sure. given events that happen in the world there. So, um, you know, the, the Navy um, and the Maritime Administration, you know, there's, there's been, you know, this real um, frustrating sort of um, inability to sort of come up with a, a consistent strategy that works. The good news is that, um, you know, and uh, there was a session over at uh, Sea Air and Space where uh, the Maritime Administrator, Ann Phillips, you know, retired admiral, was talking about the fact that uh, a few years ago we um, used a vessel construction um, management model, mm -hmm. which is much more of a sort of private sector approach to, to rebuild our maritime training ship fleet. Again, these are the vessels that we train our maritime um, students in the, in the state maritime academies, also ancient at the time. So uh, it was Admiral Busby, who was the former uh, Mayrad administrator, who, who you know, said, we, we've got to do this faster and more efficiently and quicker and cheaper than some of the other sort of plans for it. So the vessel construction manager is a you know, sort of you know, entity that basically controls the whole process of private bids, sector. And, private sector yeah. and um, so uh, if you were up at the Philly shipyard where this is happening right now, they just launched their first uh, the New York Maritime Training Ship. Right. The, the Massachusetts is, is going to happen in a few months. They, so there's like five or six of them, and they're doing it in rapid succession. It's serial manufacturing, basic hull, put all the stuff in. They're big ships. They're almost 700 feet long. Uh -huh. And, um, and you know, watching this unfold at the, at, and, and, you know, the administrator was up there to visit. Uh, and, you know, it's just like, well, why don't we use this model to, for new build, um, yeah. you know, ready reserve uh, fleet that's there. And, you know, the Navy's position over, you know, over years has been, well, we, we, we want something that's a little more um, enhanced in terms of different sort of, you know, stuff that's on board there. It gets really expensive really <laughs> fast. Right. And, and so the sort of plan B has been to buy foreign and then try to retrofit. But then, you know, the problem that our subcommittee has had with this is just that, you know, the foreign market is not really that stable. I mean, you, you, you're relying, you're, you're trying to project a cost yeah. which can change in the blink of an eye, given what's happening out there. And we're seeing that right now because right. they're getting very expensive. You know, why not have what we're doing with the maritime ships and just have a, a serial production this thing, you know, the contract that uh, Busby organized came in really just you know, right on, on target in terms of cost and timing. And that's a predictable yeah. sort of solution to this. That, it's it's this, a real success story. It, it really is. And well, so the company I was with bid on it, yeah. didn't win it. Um, the company that won it did, uh, did, uh, did succeed yeah. and, you know, on time and on, on, on budget. But if we did it for sea lift for the Navy, it wouldn't be just five or six boats. It would be a lot more. And, and right. so your former employer or NASCO or others right. you know, could really um, get in the game here. And yeah. um, the, the, again, the Philly Shipyard, um, which when they won that contract, I mean, it was down to less than 50 workers. 
Mm. You go there today, it's close to 3,000. I mean, they've just sort of brought the place back to life. I mean, this is one of the great shipyards yeah. in our history. Yeah. And, um, and Well, they uh, had been d building tankers. <laughs> yeah, okay. So then they <laughs> went in the yeah, tanker right, market, you right. know, uh, bottomed out. Yeah. Uh, they were able... But, but you know, we need. I know that, you had a lot to do with that, getting that uh, new national security multi-mission vessel right. uh, up and running. So, but the need for the ready reserve right now, particularly you know, since China's a pacing threat, the Indo-Pacific is just this vast expanse. Um, you know, we obviously lost the Red Hill refueling facility in Hawaii, right. so we need, you know, not just for the regular maritime security platforms, but also the tankers. You know, mm -hmm. the smaller tankers to move around there. So. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I personally, you know, that to me, we've shown we can do it, and, mm -hmm. and, it, and we can do it made in America, and, you know, that, that should be the, the strategy. Mm -hmm. So let's shift over now to the active uh, commercial ships actively involved. This is the sustainment side of things where, you know, once a, a, a conflict that goes on for more than a month or two, we need to sustain the troops, uh, and, and that's where traditionally the commercial sector, maritime sector, uh, kicks in. Uh, and these are ships that are in peacetime operating in normal, you know, trade routes, uh, you know, carrying petroleum or containers or whatever, whatever the case might be. But when the flag goes up, uh, they are under contract with the Maritime Administration and, and, and the Pentagon to, to, uh, to respond and, and carry, uh, help resupply troops in, in the event of contract, uh, conflict. The pro program that we've had in place, uh, which was designed in the 1990s, and I'm going to have a question in this. <laughs> so no, keep going. That's all right. But, but uh, it was, was designed with 1990s uh, you know, threat uh, paradigm in, in mind. So it produced what was 85 ships in the U.S. flagships in international trade as of the beginning of last year. Um, and um, uh, Admiral Busby, you mentioned, uh, said uh, in an interview uh, through the Hudson Institute a couple of years ago that we really need 250 ships to meet that same uh, planning paradigm in the context of a Western Pacific conflict. Totally different world turned upside down sort of thing. And so the question that you know, sort of I've been trying to grapple with is, is uh, how do we take that existing program and, and, and grow it to meet that paradigm and then also bring in a commercial uh, construction component to that. Right. Um, and and I, I, I'm not going to ask you to comment on that, but if you have a comment on it. <laughs> so, I mean, look, at, we, we uh, you know, finally at the Sea Power uh, subcommittee started to get some, you know, movement in terms of the subsidies, you know, to get more Right, um, chips available for that mission and right. um, tanker security program. Right, right. Yeah. and and um, but you know when you look at it, it's like ten boats, you yeah. know, and then I think we're we authorized another ten. And the the fact of the matter is, it's just um, you know that part of the world, it's just that's like you there's know, no gas stations. There. No, that's right. So <laughs> we we need to come up with some more bold strategies in terms of trying to you know get size this up in a way that really makes sense. So. Um, you know, I know you've been working hard on that, and we talked about it a little right. bit before. Right. And I think, uh, you know, that that we've just got to start really getting serious. Um, right. And you know, these sort of you know band aid solutions about sort of relying on, you know, um, ships built in you know other countries and trying to buy them, and you know, it, that's just not that's a stopgap at best, right. and it's just it's not going to really meet what the country needs. Right. Good. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I am. Um, I've got other items on here, but I, I, I don't want to uh, preempt the opportunity for questions from the, from the floor here, if there are some. Um, yes. Please, go ahead. Is there a microphone? Uh, I see one coming. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Lisa Lotta Odgard. I'm a senior fellow at Hudson Institute as well non-resident. Um, I wondered if you could say something about allied cooperation uh, regarding reviving the commercial and military maritime industrial base because mm, you, you talked about China and you know they, they, they build around 48 percent of the ships today and not even South Korea and Japan can keep up with their big dual use factories where they turn out commercial and military vessels. Um, 
and it has outcompeted the U.S. industrial base, but the European industrial base is also uh, suffering. Uh, I know you have cooperation with South Korea and Japan, or at least plans uh, to work together. Uh, can you say something about which co kind of cooperation you envisage for this regarding Europe and the U.S.? Because I think a lot of the concerns and how to address them uh, are actually the same uh, in Europe and the U.S. Uh, so I'd be interested to hear about that. Thank you. Sure. So, um, yeah, I think, um, you know, trying to develop a, a strategy that, you know, incorporates allies to sort of solve these, you know, huge demands um, is something that we're going to have to um, utilize. Um, you know, I was very involved last Congress or last year with um, getting the AUKUS program uh, through, which again is, is really in the same vein of what you're talking about there, which is to get three countries together who um, can now share uh, really critical technologies. That's the peer, uh, the uh, uh, pillar two component of AUKUS that's already moving out. And, um, you know, uh, it took some hard work to sort of knock down some of the export controls, uh, which we did in NDAA, um, to, to create, a, you know, sort of a fast lane for, for, for those technologies. Australia, just a couple weeks ago, passed their own um, defense export control reform bill, and the British Parliament is, is taking up the same measure that's there. And, you know, the nice thing about that approach is just that, you know, it's not just sort of, well, you know, we love, uh, you know, Japan, or we love, you know, uh, France, or whatever. And let's let's just kind of. I mean, it, it did create some structures in place that do make sure that you know critical technologies are going to be protected, and that you know we're not sort of going backwards rather than forwards with this uh, type of collaboration. So, um, you know, now all of a sudden, a lot of countries have AUKUS envy. You know, they're starting to line up, <laughs> saying, you know, we want that too. You know, right. and uh, so. Yep. Um, and I personally, I think that's a good thing. I mean, New Zealand is like, you know, how about us? You know, at least on pillar two. And, and, and I know the Japanese prime minister is in town while we're sitting here today. And I think that some of those discussions are happening as well. But, um, you know, I think the European, um, you know, shipbuilding industry has a lot to offer. We just had the Finnish ambassador up in my district uh, last week, actually, for a couple of days. It was more about their nuclear waste disposal program, which is very successful and how, you know, I've got couple of those plants in my district. We spent a lot of time talking about that. But before he left, he made sure to leave me with a folder about uh, Finnish icebreakers and how, you know, as we try to, you know, get an icebreaker capability in this country, I mean, they do it the best, you know, in terms of, and they're a trusted ally. And, you know, we've got issues in terms of uh, trade restrictions that, you know, make that very difficult. And I know we've got, you know, a shipyard that's working on that program right now, but really, you know, it kind of screams out that you know, we should be really talking to them about ways that we can get that capability because it's really, I mean, the Arctic is obviously a huge um, you know, issue right now that um, not having uh, adequate uh, icebreakers in the Coast Guard is really you know, a problem that's there. So um, uh, as I said, the AUKUS thing got through. There was definitely some resistance you know, to it in, you know, in terms of these issues of you know, sharing too much but we did it. So, you know, I think that should give people, you know, some hope that there's ways to, to you know, get this discussion broadened to other I countries. follow up on what you're saying, there are also, I think, other areas such as frigate production where European ships are often five times, ten times, five times as cheap as, as U.S. ships. And, you know, some companies do build the ships in the countries that buy them. So that would bring you know, labor to the US and it would bring um, design knowledge as well, which I think is also, you know, and we see that there could be more allied cooperation in that sense. So that, you know, labor opportunities uh, are created across the, the Atlantic and between our Right. No, I mean, I, you're right. I mean, we, we were, we, again, ab, 
just kind of dropped the ball in terms of keeping those um, programs and platforms moving forward. And, and the Europeans, in the meantime, have been moving forward. So it, it's, um, you know, it's going to, it's hard negotiation, you know, having been through the AUKUS experience, you know, to sort of get, make sure you're, you're keeping people, um, you know, comfortable uh, with, with the idea there. But it really, like I said, at some point, it's about math, <laughs> you know, in terms of just trying to and get, you know, our, our naval fleets to the size that they, they need to be. But do you think it can go through Congress? Well, what you're saying about icebreakers or common yeah. so, frigate programs, would it actually, you know, because the experience from Europe is that it's really hard in the end to get the U.S. to agree on cooperation like that. So when, when AUKUS was first announced, we got some folks in the metal trades union um, department at the AFL-CIO saying, what is this? But you know, after we sort of like worked it through and, and sort of demonstrated, you know that um, yes, you know we're, we're um, going to probably have Australian shipyard workers coming over here. That is part of the plan, you know, to to help us with increase our own capacity that's here. And um, but it's all for a good end result, which is that it's going to you know basically lift up everyone in terms of. Uh, you know, having jobs and, and a stronger industrial base that's there. So, I mean, like I said, it, you, you gotta, it's, it's I, I, I'm not gonna, you know, dismiss your skepticism because it is tough, you know, yeah. but, but as I said, it's not impossible. Yes, question? Uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you for your time and your insightful comments. Uh, Eric Lees from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Um, I was actually just at the Sierra and Space conference yesterday myself, and one of the comments that was made that really stuck out to me is that the Navy is competing with the Coast Guard and the Merchant Marine for these shipbuilding resources, which is, is going to be an issue. And looking at how the business cycles go and kind of boom and bust, the longevity of these platforms, is there any eye towards kind of coordinating between the Navy, the Coast Guard, and the merchant marines, the, the more commercial side, to provide a sustainable long-term signal to the private industries that we're, we're building up so that we're not turning around and going, hey, enjoy your boom, bust is right around the corner. Is, is there any way to coordinate that that's being molded? Because I haven't seen anything really looking at that. Thank you. So um, you know, the description I, I gave of the maritime training ship fleet that's being built at the Philly shipyard, you know, one of the things that we are on the committee that we did for really over the course of about four or five years, and I have a staff member who can attest to this, was trying to get Navy leadership to just come and see it. You know what I mean? That, and, and, you know, when you walk into the yard and you see, as I said, that serial production where you've got four or five hulls in different stages of uh, completion that you know, you can put a date, delivery date, on each one of them. You know, it, it's like you don't also have to say another word. You know, in terms of the fact that okay, this works. That's yeah, there, yeah. and that's where uh, you know, CNO, the you know, Frank Chetty, uh, she was up there, and she. I mean, it's like it's like a you know, a, a real sort of just revelation that okay, mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, we can do this in terms of the the Navy Sea Lift sort of fleet that's there. And you know the Coast Guard, um, you know, which with their icebreaker program, I mean, they had to come to the Navy to actually um, you know, get the sort of startup of, of that in terms of design work and you know, the uh, shipyard selection, because it was too big a project for them. You know, their, their shipbuilding um, infrastructure you know, acquisition just really had never sort of dealt with something that big. You know, they, they, they were sort of the you know, the smaller um, vessels that, that was sort of in their space that's there. So, I, you know, I, um, my feeling is, is that there's definitely a much better sort of, um, you know, collaboration with the sea, the sea services um, in terms of trying to, you know, sort of help each other in terms of de dealing with these uh, problems. And I, um, you know, if you look at the missions, of these sea services, I mean, they're they're overlapping now all the time. You have you know Coast Guard cutters going through the Straits of Taiwan, 
you know, or over in the Middle East that's there. And, you know, the white holes are next to the gray holes and they're just working together all, all the time. And then, you know, obviously the maritime industry, I mean, th their need to collaborate with the Navy to just protect themselves right. from attacks by the Houthis. I mean, it's just, I, I just see this now as, um, you know, it, the, the, sea, the services are, are, are really, I think they have, they're in a much better place in terms of not being so territorial. Thank you, Congressman, for coming today. And as a Tufts graduate, I have to begin with go Jumbos. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on an initiative I've been working on for a couple of years, which is to build a private stockpile of rare earths and critical metals to support the DOD and the US Navy, in particular your Columbia class submarines. And I know one, one coming up now is uh, the USS Wisconsin. Right. which is my native state, so I have a particular yeah. interest. And so the issue that I saw was the Chinese really control the production of many of these critical minerals. And I know we have the Defense Logistics Agency, which manages the stockpile, but not to be critical, um, it's not really that nimble um, and underfunded. I mean, the stockpile is uh, 3% of what it was at the time of, end of the Cold War. So my idea is a private stockpile funded by private money and to give the DOD right of first refusal whenever we sold from the stockpile. But it's been a challenge to raise the money um, because people don't um, appreciate the threat and because in the contractor system, uh, General Dynamics doesn't stockpile rare earths and their subcontractors don't either because if price goes up or they can't get a metal, they just look for an adjustment to their budget and pricing. So I wanted to get your thought um, whether you thought this was a good initiative. And I should mention uh, Admo Selby mm -hmm. uh, is supporting the effort and some other naval people. Um, so that, that's one thing. And then just really quickly, not to talk too much, but the other project I'm working on is to expand Subic Bay shipping capacity. Now, I know you're interested primarily, as you should be, in jobs in Connecticut, but I think given China churning out these ships at about a third of the cost, maybe three times faster, we need help in the Western Pacific. And I think Subic, would, as a, with the Philippines being the treaty ally, uh, I would think we can expand our cooperation with them. Great. Thank you. Yeah, so on critical minerals, I mean, that sounds like a really creative idea that's there and, you know, like to learn more about it. I think, um, you know, there's just no question that, you know, that is a huge vulnerability, you know, that the U.S. has in terms of China's, you know, almost monopoly over, you know, a lot of these um, pieces that are there. I mean, AUKUS actually, um, you know, again, has, I think, created an opportunity because you know, when we passed the NDAA, we also gave um, the Department of Defense um, authority through the Defense Production Act, designating Australia as a domestic source. Uh, and I think that you're gonna see some you know, injections of Defense Production Act investments uh, for critical mineral um, processing and developing. Um, and I think you know, Western Australia is loaded with that stuff that's there, but honestly, you know, so that's, in my opinion, that's a really smart move to create some more um, options in terms of where you can acquire this stuff. But the need is so big that I think, you know, an idea like yours, um, you know, could make a lot of sense. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's just no question that's a vulnerability that's, that's there. Um, actually, uh, the UK has some critical minerals that also the, the, they're, you know, part of the domestic source uh, reform that we put in the NDAA so that, you know, the, deep, you know, the Department of Defense can invest over there to try and develop some, some critical minerals that they have. Um, as far as Subic Bay is concerned, I mean, I, I was on a Codel in, in the Philippines last summer and, uh, you know, definitely had a lot of talk uh, uh, about that, that that's there. I mean, it's, um, you know, the, having, you know, uh, more forward deployed assets and opportunities for the fleet, I think just it just makes a lot of sense. I mean, um, you know, Guam, you know, right now is, is the place where, you know, we, we um, you know, have... No, no, I, yes. 
miles. Yes. Yeah. No, and, and that, um, you know, that, I mean, it's going to take some investment, you know, to, to kind of, re, you know, restore, I think, some of that. But I, I think, um, you know, again, I, I think there's openness to it for sure. Great. One last question. Henry Hecker, retired government. I wondered if you feel the Navy is at the moment ready to meet all contingencies in the event of a sudden expansion of the Gaza war into, you know, through the Houthis and then possibly into Iran. Um, they're waiting momentarily, I said, over the weekend for an Iranian attack on Israeli diplomats somewhere, anywhere. Nobody knew where. And if that happens, uh, you know, Israel may attack Iran to some extent. Uh, through its own forces, and, and Iran has in the past stated months ago that any attack on Iran by Israel will be considered an, an attack by America, as were their allies. So this possible expansion is critical, especially at this moment, but of course, nothing happens. It's almost like waiting for a Pearl Harbor, knowing that it could happen, but will it happen? Maybe it won't happen. Diplomats will try to work our way out of it. W what are your feelings on this? Does everything look like everything is ship -shaped? So, I mean, I do think that, um, you know, after October 7th, you know, we, we deployed, um, you know, two carrier strike forces, you know, in that part of the world. And, um, you know, I, I know, you know, it is definitely um, something that is, you know, in terms of their day-to-day um, -day sort of, um, you know, planning is, is really uppermost uh, in their, their minds. I mean, one thing that I know, uh, having talked to some of the Navy leadership, is that, you know, shooting these Houthi missiles out of the sky is really expensive. You know, we, we you know, those um, defensive measures have worked really well, I think, to, in terms of, you know, limiting damage that's there. But, um, you know, that's where I think, you know, laser, um, right. you know, um, anti-missile technology, we've, we've got to really come up with cheaper, better solutions than, than um, you know, firing rockets that cost, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more, you know, in terms of just, you know, force protection. And that's where I think, you know, and they're going through a lot of them, you know, because of the, the frequency of those attacks. Uh, that, that's the one thing I do hear back is just that, you know, this is taxing, you know, the, the munitions and uh, missile, um, you know, Stockpiles that we have right now, and it's which all sort of goes back to where we started here, which yeah, is that does. the industrial base, right. you know, is it just does. you know that's going to be part of the solution. Well, it's, it's, developing a cheaper alternative is something that I think is really it's screaming out. Uh, absolutely, and and uh, and you talked about that. I mean, it's just evidence of what a what a different world we live in right now, and how how complex the challenges are, and. And managing through them, uh, and, and sending the right messages to the bad guys is part of it, I think. And and uh, uh, and, and and part of sending the message is being able to uh, have the sea lift we need and the lasers we need and all of those resources available uh, to, um, uh, to to know that uh, they can try it, but they're not going to succeed. And and uh, and that's kind of so different from the mindset we've had for so long. Um, so. Anyway, I, I really thank you for, for being with us today. Uh, really learned a lot, and, and uh, a round of applause for, for Mr. Thank Burton. you.